Well, good evening, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm sorry I'm kind of slow in getting started tonight. We'll try to do better next time. Hopefully, I can get this to work too. Pardon? Okay. I do want to thank uh, Dempsey for taking last week while well, I stayed in the uh, warm Florida while y'all froze to death. Uh, would appreciate Ernestine, I appreciate that. Also, I do want to thank uh, Adam for the work he did in the Minor Prophets as he was setting up the way we look at the this time period that we've been going through uh, in the Bible, the time period of when we've got this uh, disastrous condition in Israel and Judah where they've turned away from God and God is going to bring <laughs> captivity upon them. Now, when we get to the, uh, and Adam did an excellent job of showing their reasons uh, for the captivity and the, and the fall that were coming and the message that came from God. We get to the book of Daniel tonight, and we're going to look over at the next few weeks. And Daniel, uh, we're going to see, is a little different than all of those minor prophets we looked at. He has not come with all of this, uh, this gloom of destruction of Israel that they come with. Rather, he comes with a, an, a, an a, a idea of looking at how we interact with our government, how we interact with uh, those that are around us, and how we devote ourselves to God. He comes to me with a very positive approach in a bad situation. And that's what I think we want to see uh, from the, the book of Daniel. I'm going to tonight to try to do just a little bit of an overview and look at some of the background uh, to, to do with Daniel. Uh, again, okay. The first thing I want to look at is a, uh, does this thing have a pointer on it? The center button, okay. Okay. I want to look at the area that is the uh, kind of our whole area of uh, activity in the Old Testament. Uh, and it's, it's based around two rivers over here in Mesopotamia called the Tigris and the Euphrates. And this is called the Fertile Crescent because it's on this map. You see it's very green here and it continues on along the coastline and comes down through Canaan, where uh, of course the land of Canaan was, and it was a land that was fertile because it, it flowed with milk and honey. And then if you'll see on the map, we come on down and there's green down here in, in Egypt. All the major activity or populations at this time uh, that are involved in the Old Testament were centered around these two rivers, along around these plains or down around in Egypt. And that's the, the major activities we see. And some of the, the uh, major groups we see, uh, of course, are the Egyptians down here, and we saw the land, children of Israel came out of Egypt. Uh, 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 Egypt was a major civilization. We're, we're familiar with seeing the pyramids and all those kind of things. It was a major civilization. civilization. Also, Assyria, developed into a major civilization. The, the uh, Assyrian people were over here on, near Haran, the north part of the area between the Tigris and the Euphrates. And then we had the Babylonian people, which we're familiar with, and we're going to see a lot of them in the book of Daniel. They developed along the, uh, the city of, of Babylon, which is the, in the land of Shinar. And if we Remember, Adam mentioned this back in Genesis, the 10th chapter, when Nimrod went to Shinar and he built the city there of Babel. And so this seems to be the origin of the civilization over in this area. And so we're going to see Babylon a lot. Also, we're going to see in the book of Daniel, the Medes and the Persians. And there are two groups of people on the eastern side of the Tigris River, uh, the Persians down close to the Persian Gulf of all places. And then the Medes were more up into the, the plains or the mountains up here. And then finally, the, uh, the group we're going to see, we're going to see two more groups 
we're going to see the Greeks and the Romans uh, as they're an influence. These are the major civilizations that influenced uh, from the time of the Old Testament, from the time of the captivity of the children of Judah went into captivity until the time we come to the, uh, to the New Testament. And all of these are going to be seen, their interactions and some of their, how they influence in the book of Daniel. Um, <clears throat> just want to mention two other places that are very significant. Uh, in the book of, uh, in the Old Testament times. And one is the, uh, a place called Megiddo, which is a little ways north of Jerusalem, just, just out from Car Mount Carmel. It was a, there was a road that came up the plain from Egypt, and there was a pass through the mountains here at Megiddo that they could go through and work their way on over to Assyria. And most of the armies that came up from Egypt and went to engage with the, the nations of uh, Assyria or Babylon, came up and went through the plain of Megiddo and the pass in the mountain there. And most of the armies that came from this region down to, uh, to Egypt came through that plain of Megiddo, uh, and that, became, that becomes, we're going to see that's significant. There's one other, uh, we don't hear so much about this in the uh, Old Testament, but there was a town up here of Carchemish. And that becomes significant because that is the, the town where the uh, Babylonians finally engaged the Egyptians and destroyed the remnants, remnants of the Assyrian army. It was up here at Carchemish, and that changed the whole complexion of the uh, of the country and the influences that were there at that time. So I, th I just we're going to mention that. I just wanted to see it's up here near Haran. And so those are kind of the places that are important for us as we're looking at the, this time in the Old Testament. I think it's kind of good to have that visual because when we talk about, just kind of memorize that map. I need to put a poster over this wall so you can see that as we're going through the book, but uh, you kind of visualize that and as we go through some of these things. Now, the the time frame we're going to be looking at in the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel starts about 605 BC. It's going to go down to about 535, more or less. It's a time frame of the Babylonian Empire and a few years into the Medo Persian Empire. I want to do want to mention one king before I get into that time frame, and that's Josiah. Josiah was the last good king of the nation of Judah. He tried to have reforms by, by uh, where they found the book of the law in the, in the temple and they, they tried to reform the people. He tried to teach the people the law, but it, didn't, it did not really succeed in reforming. It lasted for a while, but then the people turned away. And so we're going to see statements tonight about uh, why the children of Israel were taken into captivity, but Josiah tried to reform. In the year 612, Nabopolassar, who was from Babylon, he was the king of Babylon. He was Nebuchadnezzar's father. We're going to hear lots of good names in this, and I want you ladies that don't, uh, they're about to have children or something, remember these names. Nabopolassar, wouldn't that be a nice son name? And, and so just those are just names that just ring on and on. So anyway, Nabopolassar destroyed Nineveh. As we remember, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. When he destroyed Nineveh, the army kind of moved to the west out toward Haran and Carchemish. Uh, Pharaoh Necho of Egypt, he had made an alliance with, an, with the Assyrians. And so he was going to come up from Assyria up to that Carchemish and help defend uh, Assyria uh, from, from the Babylonians. As you remember that the Israelites were afraid or the Judah was afraid of Assyria 
because Assyria was the enemy from the north that had destroyed Israel. So they were afraid of Syria, so they wanted to align with Babylon because at this point, Babylon was, didn't, you know, they're way over at the end of the Fertile Crescent. They're a long ways off, and they did not see them as a real political threat. So Josiah goes up to engage uh, Pharaoh Necho at Megiddo, at that pass along that came up the border. He went up to engage Pharaoh Necho at uh, Megiddo. And if you turn and read that prophecy that, uh, that Pharaoh makes there, he tells Josiah, the Lord has sent me to do this. You go on back to Jerusalem and you'll be all right. Well, he doesn't, Josiah doesn't. He is killed there at, uh, at Megiddo. And, uh, and, but what he does, he delays Pharaoh Necho enough that it gives Nab or, or Nebuchadnezzar, who is his father's general at this time, time to, to go to Carchemish and destroy the Assyrian army. And so it allows Babylon to take charge of the, the whole north and eastern side of the Fertile Crescent, and it kind of uh, pushes. And then uh, Egypt, or Necho goes back down to Egypt. Well, on his way back down to uh, uh, Egypt, I'm going backwards. No wonder it's not working. Okay. Necho stops by Judah, or Israel, or uh, Jerusalem, and they have, after Josiah died, uh, the children of uh, uh, Judah put Jehoahaz on the throne. Well, Pharaoh Necho comes and takes Jehoahaz and takes him captive to Egypt, and he sets Jehoiakim on the throne. Uh, and uh, it says Jehoiakim on the throne and expects him to pay tribute. And that's at about 609. In 605, uh, Nebuchadnezzar or, or, uh, goes to Carchemish Kar and Pharaoh Necho comes up to Carchemish, comes up a second time. This time he makes it to Carchemish and Nebuchadnezzar defeats Pharaoh Necho and he comes on down into Judah and he, de he defeats uh, uh, Necho at Carchemish. He comes down and he substitutes Judah and he takes some of the royal lineage as captives to Babylon. And it, it seems that he's taking them for insurance so that, that the king uh, Jehoiakim will maintain his tribute and will maintain allegiance to him. He takes some of the royal uh, family to, uh, and, and some uh, captives to, uh, to Babylon. This lasted for a few years and uh, Jehoiakim rebelled and uh, Babylon came back and laid siege to Jerusalem. Uh, uh, Jehoiakim was, was killed in that. Jehoiachin was then placed on the throne he lasted for three months and he rebelled. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar is getting aggravated with the Jews by now. And so he takes 10,000 of them captive along with Ezekiel to Babylon. And then uh, he places Zedekiah on the throne as a more of a governor, not so much as a king, but a governor of the local territory. And Zedekiah, of course, re rebels and he is taken to Babylon at the destruction of Jerusalem in 586. So we have a period of time from 605 uh, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar first comes to Jerusalem until 586, uh, where Babylon is in control of Jerusalem and the, the kings that are there are subject to pay tribute to Babylon uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, during this. Now, during this time period, Jeremiah is living in Jerusalem and uh, he is there trying to get all of these kings to repent, but he, he does not. They do not listen to him. Jehoiakim actually takes the, the scroll that, uh, that Jeremiah writes and has read and he takes his knife and cuts it up and throws it in the fire. 
So that shows you a little bit of the attitude of the, uh, the kings of Jerusalem at this time that Nebuchadnezzar is carrying them away. Now, and so during, during this time period, we see that there is rebellion in Jerusalem and Babylon is coming and taking control and carrying, uh, carrying the people uh, away. And then I just want to put this on. And then 539, we're going to get to the end of the book, of, near the end of the book of Daniel. Babylon falls and the Medo-Persians come to power. And so we're going to look at that. So that's kind of the time period we're going to be looking at uh, for the book of uh, Daniel. The name Daniel itself is God is my, God is judge or my judge. Uh, we're going to see names in the Old Testament we know typically have a meaning and they're significant. And uh, uh, Daniel is, is one, uh, his name means God is my is judge or is my judge. Uh, just a few things about the, uh, uh, the book. We understand the book based upon reading through it that it is either written by Daniel or is dictated by Daniel. And, and I think that's, that's based upon several passages where, where we can have this quote, I, Daniel. So Daniel's either dictating to someone or he's writing it down. So he goes, these are my accounts that I, Daniel, uh, had. I think that's significant for us because Daniel has some, some prophecies and some messages that are very specific about things going to happen two, three, four hundred years after he's dead. Many of the modern or liberal theologians want to discredit Daniel and say, no, he couldn't have written all of this. This was written at a later time during the time of the Maccabees or some of these things. But if the book says, I, Daniel, and we consider it scripture, then it must mean that Daniel wrote it. And so that's a uh, we, we, we see Daniel either, as I say, either he dictated these things or he wrote them down. Um, a couple of interesting things here. Uh, in the Hebrew Bible, that would be the Jewish Old Testament, the book of Daniel is contained with the writings. The writings are the books of wisdom or the books of prophet or not, of, uh, of, uh, of poetry. The wisdom report, and, and so he, Daniel is included with Job and Psalms and Ecclesiastes and those books in the Hebrew Bible. Of course, in our English Bibles, it's included with the books of prophecy. Not, uh, uh, and so there's, there's a little difference here, and I think there's a couple of things that, uh, that kind of contribute to some of this. We know that Daniel is a prophet because Jesus calls him a prophet. He speaks of the prophet Daniel in Matthew 24 and 15. Much the same as David is called a prophet some for the things that he says, but David never wrote a book of prophecy. He wrote lots of Psalms and books of poetry. So uh, the book of Daniel has uh, as many elements that are common with the wisdom book. The first part of the book, and we're going to look at just a moment, is the first six chapters are generally narrative. The, the last six chapters are generally dreams, which can, can contain scenes of, of events or things that are, that are going on. So it has much of the appearance of wisdom literature. And I, I say all that to, to make us think about the way we approach the book of Daniel. When we, we pick one of the Psalms of the Old Testament, we read it, we don't expect everything to be exactly literal, but to be poetic or to carry a meaning or a symbol for some things. Much of the second half of the book of Daniel is not literal, perhaps, but it carries a meaning. He's trying to convey an idea, just as God was trying to convey ideas with the Psalms. That's not to say... There aren't literal things in the book of Daniel, and there aren't real, real accounts or real stories. There are, but there are some things that carry a meaning or a symbol to try to convey an idea to us about what God wants us to, uh, to, to know. And, and uh, I think we're, we're going to see some of that when we get to the numbers of these. Uh, uh, we, we have 
70 times seven, which is 490. And I, I like to compare that to uh, Jesus whenever he told his disciples, what did he tell them when there's, I don't know how many times you had to forgive your brother? 70 times seven. What did Jesus mean? We count up 490 and quit forgiving? There seems to be a complete number or a whole number. And I think some of these numbers we see in the book of Daniel, Daniel refers to a complete period or a whole period and not necessarily to a literal number of years. And so from that perspective, it's more like wisdom literature or the Psalms than it is like a, an, an absolute uh, a, a prophecy. Now, Jesus used uh, uh, several passages from the book of Daniel. Uh, just uh, he did here in Matthew 24. He takes a passage from Daniel and he applies it to a situation that he's looking at. And, and so uh, that to me is another reason to give credibility to, to Daniel being the writer of the book because Jesus said, Daniel the prophet said this. To me, that gives credibility to, uh, to Daniel. Uh, John uses the idea from Daniel in the book of Revelation. If you read very much in the book of Revelation, you'll see some things very similar to what, uh, what Daniel had said. And one of my, I guess one of my favorite uh, sections there is when, when Daniel is looking in one of his visions and he sees the seas are in a turmoil. The winds are blowing the seas. You've got all these waves of the seas. And all of a sudden, up out of the seas, you see these beasts coming. Well, Revelation has exactly the same symbol of a turmoil on the seas and a beast coming up. Well, uh, and, and we're going to look at that, but I just, just uh, Daniel will help us understand Revelation, and Revelation will help us understand Daniel. Uh, and God interacts with Daniel and others primarily through dreams. He does not seem to speak directly in the book of Daniel, but through visions and dreams. Whereas with the, with the prophets, God generally spoke directly. And I know sometimes they had dreams, but God generally spoke directly. Where it'd be Elijah or, or Isaiah or Jeremiah, the word of Lord came to them. But with Daniel, it comes in the form of visions and dreams. So I think there's a little bit of difference in the writing of the book of Daniel than most of the prophets. That's not to say it's not prophecy, but it's more like wisdom literature in some days and we have, or some ways. And so we have to be careful that we understand the point that the, uh, the writer is making, making for us there. The book of Daniel is, the original text is in two different languages. Uh, part of the book is in Hebrew and part of it is Aramaic. Hebrew, of course, is the language that the Jews would have spoken in Israel and in Judah. Aramaic is the, the language that the, the nations of Assyria and Babylon and that area would have spoken in Aramaic. Uh, the first chapter up to the second chapter in verse four is in Hebrew, picking up in the uh, second chapter in verse four through the end of the, the seventh chapter, it's in Aramaic, and the eighth chapter through the twelfth chapter is in Hebrew. Now, I can't tell you that I know why it is written that way. I think a couple of things it, it might suggest to us. The first chapter is all about these Hebrews got carried, carried into captivity. So it's about them. Uh, beginning in the, four, uh, the second chapter through the seventh chapter, there seems to be a lot of interaction between uh, Daniel and the, and the uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the, uh, the governments of Babylon and the governments of, of, uh, of Medo-Persia. And so their governmental act interaction seems to be in Aramaic. And then we get to the back to the end of the book of chapter eight, uh, really beginning in chapter seven through the end, but chapter eight through the end, it's back to Hebrew. And those are primarily dreams or visions that Daniel is having. And so that uh, uh, 
I think may be some of the explanation of it. Uh, as far as the type of writings, the book is generally, is it can be divided into two parts. The first six chapters are generally accounts of events. And we're, from, we're most familiar with the book of Daniels with the stories, which are accounts in the first six, six chapters. Those are the chapters that we teach in all of our children's Bible classes. I don't know that we teach any of the, the, the chapters eight or seven through 12 in our children's Bible classes. We generally teach the stories of the first six chapters. But that doesn't mean that the book is not linked together. Something we're going to see in the book of Daniel uh, is that the, the whole book, even though it's divided in these two sections, it's every chapter is interdependent upon the other chapters. And there are, it's, it's interesting that Daniel will say something in the very first two verses of the book that you get to the fifth chapter that are significant, which ties them together. Uh, and and we, we'll see that in the second chapter, we're gonna see in just a moment, is very heavily tied to the seventh chapter in, in the book. And so uh, the book is all, the things are said are very heavily tied together. So rather than picking these individual stories out and scattering them out and studying them individually, we need to look at the book as a whole and see what the message is that God has for us the book in the book as a whole. Don't have to put green and red on this thing for me, so I'll know which way is forward and which way is reverse. Okay. Uh, some of the conflicts that we see in the book, and I want just to talk about some of the conflicts we're going to see. Uh, we're going to see Daniel as a servant of God versus a wise man. That's going to occur on several occasions. And uh, the the Two verses I have here, which to me kind of summarize the attitude of the wise men, which are the, I guess, the, uh, the intellectuals of the day versus Daniel. Uh, these come, both of these come from uh, interpreting, trying to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream in the second chapter. The wise men say the gods do not dwell with mortal flesh. We can't tell you because the gods don't live with us. That is implying the gods are so remote that we can't get this answer for. Whereas Daniel says, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. That suggests that God is near to us. He wants to communicate with us and he wants us to, uh, to know him. And so that's, that seems to be the, the contrast and the different ideas we see in, in the book of uh, Daniel on that. There is a great emphasis on the contrast between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of men. We're going, uh, and uh, that's really significant for us. And it's, uh, there's one of the things that when you're reading through the book of Daniel, write down the number of times it makes a statement similar to what I have written down here from the fourth chapter. Speaking of God says, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accountable as are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? God is supreme, he is over all, and nobody can call God into account. God has a unique, uh, unique place, uh, and he has dominion. His kingdom has a unique place, whereas you, his kingdom is everlasting, it says here. If we're going to see in the book of, uh, of Daniel the different uh, uh, messages that we see, we have the Assyrians, we have the Babylonians, we have the Medo-Persians, we have the Greeks, we have the Romans, one right after another, and then they have really relatively short uh, periods of rain. Uh, and, and so that they don't last forever, but God does. And so that's one of the uh, primary conflicts of the book or the challenges or, or conflicts in the book is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of men. 
And I think that, to me, that's important for us as, as we get into this, we're going to talk more about this. Important for us to think about that today. We still have kingdoms or dominions of men's government. And then there's a dominion, the kingdom of God. Never think the two are even remotely close to the same. These are temporary. These are fallible. This is infinite. This is, is infallible. The next thing that uh, I want us to see is really significant for us is that, and we're going to see this in the book of Daniel, all through the book of Daniel. And I, I, when you read through it, write down how many times Daniel references this idea. God rules in the kingdoms of men. We're going to see all of these monarchs, such as Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Belshazzar, or uh, Cyrus, or Darius, how they think they are in charge. And you talk about a monarch being in charge. Nebuchadnezzar was in charge because if he didn't like you, he could put you to death and nobody could do anything about it. And it did not take him a long time to make those decisions. He made his decision and action was taken. We're going to see that play out in the book as, uh, as uh, the, the children are, or the, uh, the three young men are cast into the fiery furnace. I mean, it's just like that. Uh, and so you did not dare uh, cross one of these monarchs. But what is God saying? God rules over the realm of mankind. And this quote here from uh, the fourth chapter of verse 32 is very similar to the fifth chapter of verse 21. Most high God is ruler over the realm of mankind. He sits over it at whomever he wills. Nebuchadnezzar was king because God wanted him to be king. And I don't think that stopped in New Testament days. I think are kings or whom God wants to be kings. And we say, well, why do we have such terrible kings? We go back to Habakkuk's question that uh, Adam brought out so good for us. Why does God allow such horrible things to happen? Well, because that's what we bring upon ourselves with our, with our sins and, and turning away. God brings the type of ruler that will bring uh, that into account. It's, I think it's part, part of that. So that, I think that's true today, and we're going to see that in the book of Daniel, that God makes king whom he wants to, to make king. And even one time it says, even of the lowest of men, he can make them king. And so I, I think that's an important uh, thought for us there. Yeah, another thing we're going to see uh, significant in the book is it's God versus the gods. Of course, that goes all the way back to Moses, right? In Egypt, it goes all through the Old Testament. It's God versus the gods. Uh, uh, but in these conflicts, he's called the God of heaven, the most high, the king of heaven, the Lord of heaven. It is God and they are nothing. Is the, the picture we're going to see in the book of Revelation. And then this last one of the kind of the thing, or no, book of Daniel, I want us, we're going to see that his nature is he is a merciful and forgiving God. And I think that to me is, is one of the best illustrations of that is when King Nebuchadnezzar uh, repents. Uh, God forgave him. Even, even this, uh, this vicious monarch, I guess I could call him. God, God forgives him. So he's, he's merciful and forgiving. Assuming we're going to have enough time, I wanted to run through just the, uh, the book itself for just a moment and uh, uh, talk about some of the things that are in the book. Uh, we have uh, the book of Daniel begins as a, an account of four young Jewish boys use that they're called, and we assume they're probably somewhere 17 to 20, that are of royal lineage, that are taken to captivity, 
and they're going to be put into the service of the king of Babylon. And here's why they go to captivity. Surely at the command of the Lord, it came upon Judah to remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh. Manasseh would have been their great grandfather. For according to all that he had done, and also for the innocent blood which he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord would not forgive. I want us to think about for just a moment. This is a story of righteous young men taken to captivity for something they did not do. That's similar to Joseph, isn't it? That's similar to the Christians that the Romans persecuted. All of that's a shadow of Jesus Christ dying for us. The righteous suffering because of the sins of the unrighteous. I think that's one of the things the book wants us to focus upon is in the, how can that be justified? How can that be? And again, this, I think they received the answer to, the, to what was said in Habakkuk when, when Habakkuk said, Lord, how long are you going to let these sins continue? And what did the Lord tell Habakkuk? I'm sending the Chaldeans. They got the answer. The Chaldeans came and got them and carried them away. And, and, uh, and so they're suffering because of what the sins of their family. And if you think about, you know, uh, their cousin is the one who cut the scripture up and had it burned. Their great-grandfather is the one who roasted the children and took the, uh, uh, and put an idol offering in the, uh, in the temple. And so, uh, I think it's important for us to see that they are probably struggling with why we're here and why we're suffering this. Much the same that the New Testament Christians uh, struggled with that whenever the Romans began persecution or when a Jewish community would persecute them. They're probably suffering where we're trying to do the right thing and we're, we're in, a, in a bad place. Um, and so... What we're going to have in, in chapter one, uh, we're introduced with this story we're all familiar with that these uh, 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 four uh, young men, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, uh, along with Daniel, are carried away into captivity. And the first thing that the king tries to do is he wants to see, he picks them because they are intelligent. They're good looking and they show signs of wisdom. He wants to put them in his administration. So the king's, he's not all that foolish. He's picking the best young people in, in, his, uh, in his area and he's going to send them to three years of college uh, to prepare them for service in the king. There's a couple of things that are going to be interesting. And I think the challenge of this first chapter is kingdom loyalty. And this is not on a military basis, but on a personal basis. We have four young men who are carried a month's journey on foot to a foreign country without their family. They're put into a, a king's service and now they're giving these things they want them to do. And when we get to that chapter, we're going to look at, and I think the primary thing that the king was trying to do, he was trying to make Babylonians out of them rather than children of Israel. We know we're looking at the, uh, the uh, Leviticus 11, verse 45. He says, for I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. They were to be wholly devoted to God. And then we have that whole group of, of clean and unclean things that are associated with what makes them distinct, all the moral things that make them distinct, 
there seems to be the implication here that the king is trying to make them be Babylonians and take them away from God. Yeah. It, this is in contrast to Assyria, who will just displace an entire population and keep them under control. The Babylonians who had suffered from that seem to take a different path in the sense that they try to show that Babylon is the greatest, and they just want these nations to become like them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Problem that continues all the way into the first century when you find the Jews concerned about the Greek Roman influence. Uh, and, and they're trying to deal with how to keep that from uh, destroying their culture okay. uh, and their purity, even in the first century. So they had to maintain a, a Hebrew identity to be the children of God. Kingdom loyalty. Are you loyal to God's kingdom? That's that, And on a personal basis is what I see this first chapter here. Now, we see they are faithful and God vindicates them. So we'll, we'll discuss that more as we get into that uh, later. Uh, the, the second chapter is uh, this great image, and we've all have in our classes, we've painted this and hung it on the wall, and we've taken, you know, uh, paper mache balls and knocked the image down and all kinds of things like that to convey this idea. The, uh, <clears throat> this, is an image, as uh, and I think Dempsey uh, talked about this some last Sunday night, is an image representing the kingdoms of men. Uh, it's not just, it's a, we're going to see the kingdoms of men always seem to turn into evil kingdoms. It's a train of evil kingdoms will fill the world with violence. And that's what we see. And the answer to that is God's kingdom is going to come and bring peace. And I think that's the really the message of, of this. Now, there, we get into this, there's a lot of details. This chapter seven is going to help us a lot with chapter two, and chapter two is going to help us a lot with chapter seven. You know, but it's the chapter, it's the, uh, the section on the, or the chapter on the, the great image that Nebuchadnezzar uh, built there. Uh, Chapter three is the image or the, the message of the fiery furnace. I think one thing that chapter three does, it, it illustrates the growth of the king's pride. The more power you get, the more pride they get. And now Nebuchadnezzar is into the worshiping idea. And I think it shows the growth of his pride. King and people exalt themselves above God whenever they get too proud. And I think that's a message of the book. Uh, the children of Israel could not worship anybody, but God doesn't this remind you of Peter and John when they went to the, uh, the uh, that they worship God or, or and, and this is, you know, only God we worship, only God we serve. And so that's, I think that is that man tends to become too proud and elevates himself. Well, God, again, on a personal basis, these three young men, they maintain their allegiance to God and God vindicates, vindicates them. Uh, the next chapter, and I will quit with this and we'll finish up next Sunday night. Uh, Daniel, Daniel 4 and 5 are to me are very closely linked chapters. Daniel 4 is the, uh, is the vision that Nebuchadnezzar has of this great tree, we just introduced growing pride in the previous chapter. We get to chapter four now, we've got full grown pride in chapter four. We've got this tree that reaches to the heaven and it's providing for everyone. And an, an angelic one comes and chops the tree down and puts a band around it and it, it stays there in the uh, uh, dew of the ground and dew comes and falls on it, and the one who represents this tree starts eating grace. This is about God. You know, our, our, let, me, let me say it this way. And I think this is one of the uh, message throughout the, the whole book. We have this king who is set over people. 
It actually said that he has given dominion over the earth and all of those around him. God has given him dominion. He becomes proud and he becomes a beast. So God sends him out like the beast he is and has him to eat grass until he repents and he was turned into a human again. This is God's humbling an individual, bringing them, bringing them low. Now we're going to have a, I want us to look at that quite a bit as we go on, going through this. Pride takes the man from the image that God created him in, the image of God, to the image of a beast. He becomes like a beast. And so God treats him like a beast. This is a great chapter on mercy and grace from God. Because when he repents, God elevates him. He puts, it stands him up, and now he is the man, the human he should have been because he has repented and turned to God. Now, I think that's an interesting idea. Will Nebuchadnezzar be in heaven? We'll just go on to the next chapter and let y'all ponder that as we, we look at that. The next chapter is about his grandson, Belshazzar, chapter 5. Belshazzar is also a little bit prideful, and this is a chapter where I think it's interesting that we got that key piece of information in chapter one, where they brought the, the cups, the gold cups from the temple, and now Belshazzar is partying with the gold cups from the temple. He's arrogant, but he gets the handwriting on the wall, and Daniel tells him, you should have known what happened to your grandfather and not let yourself get in this shape because he became arrogant and refused to listen. He dies that night. Is that a message for us? Do we have to suffer the same grace eating experience that Nebuchadnezzar did to learn from his mistake? Hopefully not. We can learn from what we have seen in others and I think that's a great message in, in that. So I'm going to quit with that tonight. Uh, we'll finish going through just our cover. Oh, I want to do this overview so you can see, are these first five chapters connected? They're not independent stories. They're very tightly connected uh, to each other. And so uh, we'll pick up there uh, next Sunday night and we'll get into some detailed look of the first chapter. Let's have a word of prayer. And David, would you lead us in a prayer? Let's pray together. Holy God, we sit and hear words from your scriptures and are amazed at the intricacy of your plan and the wisdom that you set to in place and the way you have put your spirit and your will into action through the men of this world, the men of ancient days that we can study now and learn more about you. We thank you for that wisdom and we thank you for that plan. Especially tonight, Father, we thank you for sharing that wisdom with us through this Bible that we carry with us and study from. Father, as we leave this place tonight, we pray that you will cement this lesson into our hearts and prepare us to study this book together and to learn all that it has to show us about your plan and how your plan was in place here that is still in place today. And Help us to understand those links and those foreshadowings of things to come and how those all reflect your character and help us all to understand that these also show us a glimpse of what is ahead. As we live our lives, we hope that we are in service to you and to bring glory into your name. We ask it where there are opportunities that you put us in the right place to help 
others as your servants, put us in the right place to show others your word and help them to know and to come to love you the way we do. We leave here tonight with another cold winter night ahead of us and a week of being out and being about. And we pray that you'll watch over us and protect us, protect us from sickness, protect us from accident, and secure us in knowing that as we go through this world, this world is not the final answer. So the days that we spend here, we need to be spending in your service and fulfilling your will on this world. We ask all these things in your son Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.